some civil servant somewhere, some management level civil servant decided that the job I was doing wasn't a job that was administrative officer level. It was a job that was for the level above me. So the job I'd been doing for two years, I was no longer qualified to do. That little episode in John's life turned out to be his biggest gift in his life. From that moment on, when he was told he was no longer qualified to do this job in the civil service, things started to change direction. You know, sometimes episodes in our life occur and we don't understand why they occur. Well, my theory, if some of you who know me, has always been that we only get gifts in life. And this was a massive one for John. Enjoy the rest of his story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, John. How are you today? I'm very well, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. And I've been watching, actually watching your podcast, which I think is also really cool. Obviously, I will be subscribing to your podcast. And the funny thing is that, that the podcast that you do and my podcast are very similar in the amount of episodes we have. So you've done 35. This yep, is number right. 37. So I'd, I'd love to talk about that a little bit when we get an opportunity. But I'm going to start with my first question, which my listeners by now know is the same every single episode. And that is, we'd like for you to share a little bit about your personal life, where you were born, a bit about your education journey, where you now live, maybe a bit about your family if you wish to, but don't feel you have to, uh, any hobbies or interests. And I can see you, you live, you're still living in Devon? I am, yep. yeah. Uh, sorry, so, Devon, at the moment. So I'd love to know how you got there. Um, so over to you. Fantastic, yeah. So uh, I was born and bred, actually, in Plymouth. So I've oh, wow. lived here all my life. I'm now 40 years old. Um, brief foray abroad um, in my teens. I spent about uh, three months living in Portugal, mm. uh, like an exchange, um, you know, exchange program. Mm -hmm. I think the... One of the key things that I found, certainly at school, was I I was quite good at school. I was quite academic. Yes. But I fell out of love with learning when I was at secondary school. So probably age, I don't know, 14, 15. Hmm. Um, certain topics interested me. Business studies, for example, interested me. Several other topics did not interest me. Hmm. <laughs> um Geography, history, English literature did not interest me. You know, reading To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm sorry. You know, it bored me to tears. It really did. Yeah. But the curriculum said you had to follow this path. And I remember one day we had a visit from the careers teacher. And you had to fill in this questionnaire. And it was about 100 questions all about, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you you know, how do you rate yourself according to this criteria? Um, and at the end of it, they would tell you what jobs you were suited to. And they're all jobs because, of course, you know, businesses didn't exist, did they? It was jobs. You had to get a job when you left Absolutely, school. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and the two jobs that this this survey told me that I should be doing was either a judge, which I still laugh to this day, imagining me as a judge, or marketing. And I remember looking at marketing and thinking, oh, that's, that sounds really interesting. Mm. Um, I quite fancy that. At which point the careers teacher said, yeah, well, you'll have to move to London if you want to do that. <laughs> we, we don't do that in Plymouth. Thought, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, I, I, won't, I won't do marketing then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, well, I think, why, where did I go down that road? Oh, I started looking at hospitality because that was the, the second tier of advice was okay you could look at the hospitality trade and i said okay i want to own a pub right well no you can't own a pub 
you know, that, that's that's something that other people do. Yeah. Um, here in Plymouth, we work in hotels or we work in cafes. Right. Okay. Right. So what? How do I do that then? Uh, well, we haven't got a course that fits that. <laughs> you need to you need to leave the school and do this, um, you know, G B Tech course mm. in hospitality and management. And I said, look, what I really want, I want to be rich. I want to run my own business. Mm. <laughs> oh, you can't do that. We we teach you how to do jobs here. Oh dear. So I thought, okay, where where do I go from here? I think it was trying to choose. Um, oh, what do they call it? Work experience. Yes. Trying to choose a work experience placement uh, that would suit, you know, I wanted to go out there and do my own thing. Yeah. Um, they said, no, if you want to be rich, um, you need a nice, safe, secure job. Mm. And there is no safer, secure job for a 16-year-old kid than joining the civil service. Oh, my God. Yes. So they said, you know, Look at office jobs. So I did my work experience with um, Royal Sun Alliance. Um, I'm going to interrupt you there. And you okay. you trusted them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because as a young person, <laughs> as a young person, you listen to the adult, don't you? And you yes. go, okay, no, yeah, you're older than me. So you're yeah. experienced. So I've got to listen to you. <laughs> yes. Because it wasn't just the teachers telling me this. This was coming from my parents as well. Yeah. Because that was their generation of, oh, my gosh, if you join the civil service, You've got a job for life there. Yeah. You've got a really good pension. You know, it's it's a fantastic, safe career. And that, that was their criteria was, are you going to lose your job in two years, three years, five years' time? Mm. You know, as far as they were concerned, running a business, being part of it, but even being employed by a private business, they saw that as risky. Yeah. Because that business could crash, could fail. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was interesting, you know, I said, I did the work experience with the insurance company. Um, do you remember they, they used to have Michael Parkinson advertising like in the back of the Sunday papers, if you fill in this form, I'll send you a free Parker pen. Oh my God. He's, I mean, he still does the advert. He still for that. does that. He just, he just really, really looks old now. You know, I think <laughs> at the time he was, oh, he resonates with the elderly people. Now it's, he is old. I mean, um, oh my God, the money he's earned through that over the years. <laughs> and, all, and all he's done is sat in a chair yeah. and had his foot taken. <laughs> uh, fantastic you know, opportunity for him. But all I did as my work experience for an entire week was I stuffed those Parker pens into envelopes. Oh, my God. And it, it was it was so destroying. But I thought, yeah, you know what? I could do this. Mm. This is a safe, secure job. So I finished my GCSEs, and I looked to get a summer job. And I went to the job centre here in Plymouth on a daily basis. And there aren't many 15-year-olds that were visiting the job centre every single day. No looking for work i was i was one of them so i got to know the staff there and they're like yeah what it was almost why are you here you, you don't were keen. need to yeah because they were used to the only people that turned up regularly at the job center were those that were told they had to turn up regularly and had to you know had to get had to apply for jobs in order to get their benefit that's right for me i was there because i wanted a summer job and eventually one of the one of the ladies there said Look, you're in here every day. So I, I can see you, you're driven, you're bright. Um, you know, what are you expecting at your GCSE? So I explained, you know, what my projected grades were. She said, well, it's not a summer job, but we've got a YTS position here in the job center. Mm. And I said, all oh, right, okay. How much are you paying? And she was like, yeah, it's £29.50 a week. <gasps> okay. No, to me, that was, oh, great. You know, I, I, at the time I had a paper round. Yeah. So I was earning a pound a day. Mm. Six days a week. I was earning six pound a week. So to go from six pound at to twenty nine pound fifty, fantastic. I've just, you know, increased my wage by five times. That's amazing, yeah. Yeah. Um so I said, okay, sign me up, but on the proviso, you know, I'm only gonna be here. Obviously I'm on study leave now. I'm only gonna be here for about two and a half, maybe three months before I go back and I do my A levels. Mm. That's fine, John. You know, I fully understand that. You know, we'll get you in. Start you off, see how we go. I think within three weeks of starting that YTS position, I decided I wasn't going back and doing my A levels, regardless of what my GCSE results were. Yes, because all of a sudden my my role in the job centre was to look 
at the job adverts that were coming in from employers. So real employers, real businesses were suddenly giving us these adverts and every single advert said experience essential. Wow. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. So these employers, and I was speaking to the employers on the phone, uh, you know, I don't think they knew they were speaking to a 15 year old who hadn't even got his GCSE results yet. But (laughs) as far as they were concerned, they were speaking to a a seasoned civil servant. Yes. And they, you know, they were saying to me, well, yeah, I don't really care about the the qualifications. You know, oh, you don't, you don't need them to have, you know, well, they need to be able to read and count. That's about it, really. Oh, so it doesn't really matter if they've got a C or a D in English maths. No, not at all. Right. Do you want A-levels? No, nah, no, don't really care about A-levels. I want somebody who's got experience. I want somebody who's been doing this for two years. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God. The, you know, the actual employer, it was, it was like I had left my little cocoon and I joined the real world. And it's interesting, n- none of your teachers or you know, work experience people or whatever they're called, you know, careers advisors mm. would actually tell you that that was one of the magic recipes for getting a job is no. having experience. Well, I th- I th- I'm a little bit cynical now. And yes. I, th- I think that they deliberately try and keep people in the system mm. for a monetary gain. That's, you know, I've seen it with my, um, my niece and nephew. They weren't of particularly course. academic. Course. And they were persuaded, or certainly my nephew was persuaded to stay on and do three A levels, um, which I think, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was quite academic and I was only going to be doing two. Mm. And that was going to be tough work. Yeah. yeah they, they persuaded him to do three A levels. He completely failed at them after a year, once they'd been paid and they'd uh, got their, uh, their budget out of him. They said, oh, wh- why don't you drop two of them? And just concentrate on an AS level in this last one, and it, you know they, they completely failed him. Mm. Um, I, I remember sitting there in the lecture theatre in my last year. So I've, I think we've just, you know, we, we, this is during the final exams, um, and we had a pep talk from the head of year about what to do next. And I remember him saying along the lines of, "You can go and get a job. You can leave here now, and you can go and earn some good money." Mm. But that's short term thinking because, oh, my God, you're going to earn so much more money if you stay in the system. Mm. Do your A-levels. Go to university. You're going to be so much better off. Mm. Do not go out there and join the real world. If you join these businesses, they can sack you like that. Mm. You can be gone in a moment's notice. And it was just fear. They played on children's fear. And then the children went home to the parents and discussed it with them. And again, the parents were of the generation that they were afraid that they were going to, you know, not have a safe, secure job. That was the only criteria. I mean, it's not like that was history and that's how it was. It still is like that today. You know, it hasn't changed whatsoever because that's, and you know, how many graduates are walking the streets unemployed? I know employment record figures. But there are still plenty of graduates out there that aren't getting jobs. You know, oh, absolutely. And they've got massive debts around their necks too. Yeah, exactly. There was um, I was listening to a podcast. Oh, this was about a year ago, and there was this quote. I'll try and remember it now. And it was, "We are, oh, we are giving money we don't have to people who don't need it to do to train them for jobs that they'll never have." <gasps> <laughs> yeah, and, and training for jobs that will never exist because by the time they come yeah. out of the system, there are different jobs there now. Exactly, yeah. You know, I mean, how artificial intelligence and you know robotics and everything is going to change the world over the next decade. I mean, my, my kids are now eight and six. Mm. So am I going to try and predict what the world is going to be like in 10 years? You know, 10 years ago, if you'd said to me, well, actually, we're going to have um, a car that's going to be driving in space whilst taking a selfie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, yeah, yeah, don't be ridiculous, you know, and yet we've all seen it now. Yeah. You know, um, kind of puts the flat earth theorist to bed, I think, mm. but, you know, I'm sure they'll come up with, uh, with some reason why that's not real. But I'm not going to try and second guess what the world's going to be like in, in 10 years' time. You know, if we're sat here in 2028 and my eldest son is 18, 
he has gone through the next 10 years of schooling, training him, I think, for a 20th century job. Mm. And that's my concern. That's why I'm trying to encourage him to actually say, you know, think for yourself. Don't act. You know, I, I have actually uttered the words that sometimes. Yeah. You don't always need to listen to your teacher. <laughs> oh, but listen to me. <laughs> yeah, your teacher doesn't always know best. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be very dangerous, I know, once he reaches secondary school, because he was like, yeah, but dad says. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and by the way, if any teachers are listening, you know, we love you. We, we think we you're do. doing a really, really tough job. It's just, unfortunately, the curriculum that you've been given to teach is out of date. That's basically it. Is, um, it. <laughs> I should put the caveat there. My wife is a teacher. Okay. So we, we do have this conversation and it, this, it does create a little bit of tension at times when I'm sort of, no, it doesn't need to know that. Oh, that's just academic. No, don't worry about that, mate. Yeah. We, we, you know, you don't need to worry about getting a job. And we'll your make, wife you know, is amazing. You can always make money. <laughs> yeah. Your wife is amazing and she does a really, really tough job. She does. For... Oh, absolutely. I mean, she's, she's officially part time. Mm. She works Monday, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. She actually works seven days a week. She works evenings, weekends. Of course. You know, she probably only puts in an 80-hour week, um, you know, for those three days she gets paid for. Mm. But as I do say to her, you know, of course, you, you've only got 13 weeks holiday a year. That's right. You finish, you finish work at half past three every That's single day. Right. Uh, you're in the pub at lunchtime, aren't you? <laughs> and, and if that doesn't rile her up, I just use the, well, don't forget, like, darling, those that can do and yes. those that can teach. She loves that line. Absolutely loves it. <laughs> My wife told me that line a few years ago and I can never <laughs> quite remember it. And I went, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And yeah. her best friend, she went to see at the weekend, actually in Bournemouth. She um, was ahead at a, at a school. She kind of got um, some sort of creative IT college or whatever. And she's given it up. Yeah. She's now take a cut in salary and she's working in some furniture creative studio. Yeah. And, and probably uh, much less stressed. Yeah. She just couldn't cope with it anymore, you know. Yeah. And so that so there is a another side to it, isn't it? That that teachers aren't given the resources, they're not given the right curriculum, they're not in the modern world. No, exactly. They are in that nice, safe, secure job. Correct. And what they're trying to do is provide safe, secure jobs for their children mm. or for their, you know, for their pupils. Um, okay. I, so I just, anyway, you were you were putting Parker pens in envelopes. That was the last <laughs> bit. <laughs> I was. Yeah. So I, I ended up then in the in the job centre. Yeah. And job centre. That's it. Sorry. Yeah. Job centre. Yeah. Summer summer job. Temporary job. All these adverts coming in. Yeah. Exactly. And then it finally it reached that point where I I remember thinking to myself why the hell am i going back to school and i had actually had the conversation then not with my teachers not with my parents but with my colleagues at the job center and i said to them look what do you think you know i i want to get one of and i picked up a piece of paper from a job that came in i said i want to get a job like this mm-hmm. is going back to school and doing my a level was going to get me that job and every single one of them said no no if you want that job, you need two years experience. Mm. You need to have worked in an office role or in this particular role for two years. Yeah. They, they do not care whether you've got an A level in business studies. They don't care if you've got, you know, um, a science degree, what they're, what that job is looking for. Now, if you, you know, a little bit of a caveat there, obviously, if you're looking to become a doctor, a dentist, a surgeon, staying at school and getting your education and your degree is absolutely the right thing of for course. me. For the path that I wanted to take at that time, it wasn't right. But I was told that it was the right path. The teachers told me it was the right path. My parents told me it was the right path. But in the real world of, and I think that really helped that I, I had a group of people who had no vested interest in me, but who had the experience and the knowledge that I wanted. So I, I was looking for the blueprints of how do I get a job? in the civil service because obviously I was a YTS. So it wasn't a permanent job I had with them. Sure. I was there as a summer job. It was officially a two year placement. You know, I'd get an NVQ level three in customer service or something at the end of it. Mm. Um, and then I'd be out on the streets, but I was able to speak to these people who were literally giving out the jobs. Yeah. 
<laughs> and saying, right, what do I need to do to get these jobs? Sure. And they basically mentored me and said, okay, if you want this job that I'm looking at right now, you need this experience. You need to be able to prove these skills. Best place for you to do that is here. And, oh, by the way, you're going to get to see the jobs that come in that are available before anybody else sees them. Yeah. You can speak to the employers directly before they even go up on the jobs boards. I mean, this is this is 1994, so this is pre-internet as well. So the, you know, the likes of you know online jobs boards didn't exist there. You couldn't just fire your CV off. It was all personal. You wrote letters. You sent CVs. You know, I had my CV polished up by the job center, by the people who were giving out the jobs. Mm. Um, and I remember going back to my parents and saying, guess what? I'm leaving school. <gasps> that was an interesting conversation because as far as they were concerned, they were very proud of me in advance because I was going to be the first generation of the family to go to university. Right. And that was that was the path I was on. And they were so proud that you know, this is my son. He's going to university. Do you know he's, he's going to be the very yeah. first one to go there. They'd, they'd then, already seen it. They visualized it. They yeah. saw you graduating. They saw exactly, yeah. They, they, they saw were the there whole at thing. The graduation, the, the yeah. hats up in the air, everything. Yeah. Oh my and god! And then I said to them, "No, I'm leaving. I'm leaving school." And they went, "Oh, well, what are you going to do?" I said, oh, "I'm going to do stay at the job center. That's that's twenty nine pound fifty a week." <laughs> yeah, and of course, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. My dad was an electrician. He was. Actually earning pretty good money, he was working away. He's he was probably earning a thousand pound a week. Mm. And he said to me, "You're going to leave school for a job that only exists for the next two years and pays you less than thirty pounds a week." <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right, Dad. So we had a little bit of a toing and froing, and I don't know how I did this because I I don't believe I was a very strong person. As a teenager, I believe I was quite shy and easily swayed, easily intimidated. But I, I, my mind was made up mm. that you want me to get a nice, safe, secure job. There is no more secure job than the civil service. The way I'm going to get that is by having two years experience of working in the civil service. Yes. And getting all the jobs that come in. So literally, as soon as the CSA were advertising, as soon as the benefits agency were advertising, as soon as the land registry were advertising, I saw it first. And I was able to speak to other civil servants and said to them, right, who's the person that's interviewing for this job? Okay, what are they looking for? Right, I'll tailor my CV accordingly. Um, I think I actually, I, again, I quit the YTS position. That lasted Oh, about yeah, about nine months. Then I went to Portugal on the on the exchange program. Came back from Portugal mm -hmm. in the April, straight back into the YTS position again. Right. And I think literally the the week I was back, um, my supervisor came to me and said, "Oh, the benefits agency are hiring in July. Um, they've got." Now, how many jobs were there? I think they had they had 30 jobs available. Wow. She said, um, it's for uh, an administrative officer position. So this is kind of level. So if you imagine I'm YTS, and then there's the, I don't know, the T boy. Uh, <laughs> then there's administrative assistant. Then there's administrative officer. So this was, this was a couple of rungs up on the ladder. She said, you know, you probably won't get it, <gasps> but it'll be good practice for you to go for this. This is you know, just the sort of job you should go for. Yes. Um, and so she prepped me. She trained me in, okay, I'm going to do a practice interview. Uh, let's get the CV nailed. Let's get the covering letter nailed. Um, let's find out who's on the interview board. Let's actually tailor it for them. Mm -hmm. And I went along and I, I got the bloody job. Um, so I was 17 years old. Um, I got the job that people, you know, other people who'd been promoted to this job, it had taken them seven, eight years. You know, they were in their mid, mid to late twenties before they got to this level. I got there at 17. Wow. Um, 1500 applicants for 30 jobs and I got one of them. <laughs> so I must, they must've seen something in me. Yeah. No idea what to this day. <laughs> <laughs> but there we go. I was, I was in, I was in the civil service and age 17, 
all of a sudden mum and dad were like yeah okay you didn't know what you were doing two years ago <laughs> brilliant um and i'd suddenly I'd, I'd you know i had more money than i knew what to do with because i'd gone from 29 pound 50 a week to a massive salary of five thousand pounds per year <laughs> <laughs> uh, which again you know some of the people on my training course were like you're, you're earning five thousand pounds i said yeah that's right why why are you only earning five grand so oh, they had this age tier thing oh yeah so because i was only 17 that was the most i could earn yeah and they were like well i wouldn't get out of bed for 100 quid a week whereas i was thinking well that's three times what i was on last week so of course i <laughs> of course i will yes <laughs> um so there was i was all of a sudden, I was in what I thought at the time was my dream job. Of course. It was that safe, secure job, a job for life, great pension. Um, and also, I- you'd, you'd created this plan for yourself, right? You had a strategy and you decided, right, I'm going to stay here for two years. I've got all the right people around me. They're helping me. They're mentoring me. I can see all the jobs coming in. Yeah. Okay, somebody else has given you that or showed you that particular job before it was yeah. advertised. So and and they had the right idea and supported you on that journey and that's that was an amazing gift. And of course if you've achieved that and then got that job at that young age, yeah, you're going to go, yeah, I've landed the right job here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, age 17, I'm I'm AO level. So let's let's say 3 or 4 years I'm going to get another promotion aren't I I'm going to be EO um mm. by the age of 30 I'll be HEO and mm. then by 35 or 40 maybe SEO and then before you know it I'm going to be you know, like the chief commissioner <laughs> of benefits <laughs> agency by the time I'm kind of 50 55 that was that was where I thought I was heading yes um unfortunately I absolutely hated the job oh man <laughs> um it, I actually had several different roles within the civil service. There was one job that I absolutely loved. And it was basically it was going to customers' houses. So if they put in a new benefits claim, um, I would literally drive out to their house, go through the form with them, make sure they, you know, they had all their pay slips and their bank statements and all their documents and, you know, make sure they had applied for everything they were entitled to and, you know, make sure they weren't still working or anything like that. And it was just every day was different. And it was just me on my own driving around the streets of Plymouth and the surrounding Devon countryside. Yeah, I used to love, we used to have days whereby we'd be out in the sticks mm. and they just every, you know, every couple of weeks they'd send one person. It was just right. You're, you're out in the sticks today. You're off to Kingsbridge or you're off to Tavistock. And it was, oh, brilliant. I get to drive along the coast. And I, it would be, a, it would be a day like today. I'm looking out my window now and I'm seeing blue sky and clear day mm. drive along the coast. I can eat in a cafe somewhere and mm. it's just, Oh, it's just me freedom and no one else. And it was the complete freedom yeah. to just be by myself, getting the work done, meeting different people, be something different every day. And I absolutely love that until one day some civil servant somewhere some management level civil servant decided that the job i was doing wasn't a job that was administrative officer level oh it was a job that was for the level above me so the job i'd been doing for two years i was no longer qualified to do oh my god (laughs) so there was a blessing to that in that i think the unions got involved and said well okay if if that's uh, an eo job now then it's been an eo job for the last two years so you should backdate him mm. um his uh, temporary promotion pay for that yeah so i was temporarily promoted to executive officer um for a couple of months backdated for two years so i had a nice little lump sum blimey uh, perfect timing because we just got married just moved into the new home um but all of a sudden it was okay the job you've been doing that you absolutely love you cannot do that job anymore. We, you need to move. You need to do something else within the civil service. Um, and I knew, having done several processing jobs within other departments within the civil service, I didn't want to do that. I hated that with a passion. Yeah. Um, so I said, no, actually, do you know what? I'm going to transfer departments. So I transferred from the benefits agency to the child support agency. Right. Which, in hindsight, was a big mistake. Oh. Uh, because I really, really hated that job. I went from even more. Working, I did. I went from working with people who I really liked and really respected, 
to not knowing anybody. Yeah. I'd gone from being that 17 year old kid who was kind of overachieving to suddenly uh, a culture whereby my bosses were younger than me. They were two years younger than me. And all of a sudden I went, I was going there with, well, I've got five years experience in the civil service now, but as far as they were concerned, now you've got zero experience with us. You know, I, I went for a promotion, uh, didn't get it because I hadn't been in the CSA long enough. Mm. The fact that I'd been in the civil service and doing this job for five years suddenly counted for nothing. And I was seeing people younger than me getting promotions just because they'd been in that department nine months longer than me. Whoa. And it just completely disillusioned me. Yeah, um, that hurts. And and the, the job, I absolutely hated the job. You know, my, my job within the child support agency was to ring up absent parents who weren't paying their child support and say, where's the money? Yeah. And can you imagine how tough that is? You're dealing with very, very raw emotions. People have just split up from the love of their lives. Often they're not even seeing their children. Mm. And I'm ringing them up saying, I want money off you. I know. (laughs) That is a horrible job. Mm. And do that job day in, day out, and just be told, here's your targets. You've got to get so many people paying their their child support. And I I bet you got some abuse, didn't you, as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, ironically, you know, we, we had to... We had to use fake names in case people sort us out. We weren't right. allowed to park in the same place every day in, in case people put a bomb under the car. <gasps> I mean, it was literally, yeah, those, those were the kind of threats oh that people were God. getting. I didn't get anything like that myself, but they, you know, they, they took security very, very seriously there, um, which it, it doesn't make for a very nice place to work. No. Um, so much so that I think I started there on – I sat there in July. It was the yeah, 13th of July, something like that. On the 1st of August, I launched my business. <laughs> <laughs> so during my initial three-week training, I'd heard so many other people moaning about, oh, my God, this is a horrible place to work. The average life expectancy here is 18 months. You know, I'd gone from the previous job whereby the average life expectancy was probably 40 years you know, there's people I know now from my early civil service days who are still there, and some of them are just retiring now after having spent 40 years in the same job. I'd gone from that to, yeah, you'd be lucky if you last 18 months. Um, and I was just hearing lots of negativity. So I decided within my initial three-week period, right, I need to look at something else. So I started the the first business literally whilst on my training. Mm. Um, it was so bad. I even started smoking again. <laughs> so I'd given up smoking in the January of this year. Right. Uh, this is going back to 2000 now. Right. And then started the job in July. By August, I was smoking again for the simple reason that if I smoked, I could have a five minute cigarette break in the morning and a five minute cigarette break in the afternoon. That's 10 minutes a day. That's 50 minutes a week. That's nearly an hour a week away from my desk. And so I, that, is, that was my only rationale. Well, I guess and there was some stress relieving um, things going on in my brain. But I, what a backwards decision that was to think, actually, I'm going to start smoking again. Well, you know, just so I can get away from my desk. I, I don't smoke, but I have this theory about breathing. You know, if you breathe, you mm. take a deep breath in through your nose or yeah. through your mouth and then out through your mouth again or through your nose, whatever you do with smoking. You're relaxing the body. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when people say, well, smoking relaxes me. Yeah, of course, because you're taking deep breaths. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. Okay, you yeah. get a nicotine hit maybe as well, but yeah, overwhelmingly that, so. what you get relaxed by is your your breath <laughs> at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. So, yeah, kind of getting away from it, feeling stressed in the job and getting away for from it for an hour a week at least allowed you to kind of get some relaxation for yourself. <laughs> It was, it was the only way I could deal with it. And then, of course, I say it was five minutes, but I'd stretch that to 10. Of course I would. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, I, I just need to take a quick toilet break a minute. Yeah, just, you know, yeah. sit, in, sit in the cubicle with my Nokia 3210 playing Snake. <laughs> um, or I'd, I'd sit there with a the calculator and I'd work out how many minutes I had left until the end of my shift. And how many seconds was that? Oh, my God. 
that was how bored I was. I mean, you say clock watching. I was literally working out how many seconds it was until I could leave. I've never heard anybody do that. <laughs> That's oh, incredible. It was, it was just, I really, really hated it with a passion. Um, and I think but that was good because if I hadn't have hated that job so much, I would never have left. You know, I wouldn't have been able to launch the business because I, my, the biggest challenge I had when I launched the business was I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing about the business I was going into. I was, my first business was a, an internet marketing company. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew nothing about marketing. I knew nothing about the internet. I didn't have access to the internet. I didn't even own a computer. No. <laughs> So, but I, I, the press was full of like um, Brent Holberman and Martha Lane Fox yeah. and um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, all all these young twenty something kids having an idea and making millions or billions in some cases just by having an idea. And they weren't making any money; they just had an idea. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have an online auction. It's gonna be called eBay. Would you like a couple of million dollars? Yeah, of course you can. Fantastic. I've created this ticket selling thing called lastminute.com. Have a billion dollars. Yes. Brilliant. I thought I could do that. I've got ideas. I'm young. I'm the same as them. How hard can it be? It was It was quite hard as it turned out. Um, so I, I used to go to my, what was my girlfriend at the time? She's now my wife. Um, go to her parents and say, look, can I borrow your computer? Can I borrow your internet? I'd sit there for half an hour in the evening after doing the day job, um, trying to make money through this internet thing that I was hearing so much about that all these millionaires were coming up with and they just needed ideas. So I went online, I bought some domain names because that was the secret. I was going to buy this domain name and then the phone was going to ring and it would be, um, Larry page or it would be Brent Holman saying, Hi, John. See, you've got this domain. Brilliant idea. Can I give you a million pounds for that's that? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Of course it. you can. Yeah. Of course you can. Not a problem. Um, you know, here's where to make the check payable to. Yes. But the phone didn't ring. No. <laughs> and so I went out and I tried spamming some news groups. Do you remember news groups? No. <laughs> oh, they, they were like... They were like the Facebook of their day. Right, yes. Um, it, you had these different news groups. They were all about different topics. And it was basically you, you logged into Outlook and you had your email inbox and then you had news groups. And news groups was – it was like a forum. It was like Facebook groups whereby, you know, I would go on there and s- try and flog these domain names. And, of course, nobody was interested. Nobody at all was biting. I, all I was doing was wasting money. I mean, these domain names, you know, I buy them now and they cost me five quid. Mm. I think – Back in 2000, 2001, they were costing me 70, 80 quid I know, each. I know. They were really expensive. Um, and I remember I, I, I used it as a, actually as a quote in my book. And I still remind her of this to, to this day. But my now mother-in-law said to me after about four months, actually, no, she didn't say to me. She said to her daughter, my I know wife, fiance probably at the time, why is John wasting his time and money on this internet thing? <laughs> it's never going to work out. Yeah. Why on earth is he wasting his time? Mm. And I, I still, to this day, go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, totally wasted my time on that, didn't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting because I, I knew that I knew nothing. So I had to self-teach myself everything. The very first kind of personal development book I bought was Internet Marketing for Dummies. Yes. Literally, it was written for me because I knew nothing. Um, and I kind of realized, okay, if I'm going to do this internet thing, I actually need to build a website. I actually need to get customers, real people to that website. Yes. And I need to find a way of monetizing the people who get there. And that was a, a long, drawn out process. There was a lot of trial and error mm. and then eventually same as i did with the civil service uh yeah with the civil service in the job center i found a mentor i found a guy called clark who had done exactly what i wanted to do wow but he'd done it about two years earlier so 
I, I cannot imagine this happening in many other sectors, but I was able to just email Clark and say, hi, I'd like to do what you're doing, please. Could you tell me how to do it? <laughs> and whereas most people go, no, bugger off. Clark went, yeah, sure. What do you want to know? Oh, okay, right. Well, how do I get traffic to the website? Okay, well, you need to go to this place and you need to do this. Oh, okay. Right, how do I make money out of this? Oh, well, you need to join, sign up with this network here and promote this and put this banner on here. Um, oh, we used to do this a couple of years ago, but that doesn't work anymore. Um, have you got an email list? We'll get that set up. Oh, okay. And literally, I just bled him dry of all of his knowledge. Wow. Um, I just, you know, for no, there was no payment. Nothing changed hands there at all, other than when we eventually met up, there was a lot of beer bought for him. Yes. And probably a lot of takeaways and <laughs> lots of, you know, I bloody owe you, mate. And even to this day, you know, here we are now, what, crikey, nearly 20 years later, um, I still remind him that I would not be sat here now if you hadn't have helped me because I knew nothing. And I went to the guy who had the blueprints for what I wanted to do and yeah. said, tell me what you know. And if, if he had said, no, bugger off, I possibly would have still be, I'd probably still be sat in the civil service now. Probably still smoking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd probably have turned it into a hundred a day habit by now. <laughs> Very unhappy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but without, without Clark helping me, I would never have reached the point whereby I knew it was going to work. And even that took a long time. And I still remember the moment that I knew I could make this work. And that was about nine months after first starting the business. So we'd got, we could just got married. We were on our honeymoon. And when I got back from our honeymoon, there was a check waiting for me. And it was my very first affiliate commission check mm. from the business. So it was the first bit of money I'd actually earned from the business. And I really wish I'd framed that check now. Yeah, I bet. It was for 13 pounds and 51 pence. Blimey. And I remember thinking, great, that's 13 quid in the bank. And then I thought, actually, no, that's not 13 quid in the bank. That's 13 pounds and 51 pence that I have earned not by selling my time, because let's face it, I've put in about a thousand hours to earn this 13 that's quid. Right. <laughs> I can earn a lot more just doing some overtime in the civil service. Yeah. But this is money that I've earned for actually doing something, for selling something. Mm. So all I need to do now is scale that up. If I've got 10 people a week coming to my website, can I get that 10 a day? Can I get 10 an hour? Mm. Can I get 10 a minute? Can I get 10 a second? Then, okay, can I increase the monetization? And it was that realization that if I've earned 13 pound and 51 pence in nine months, I can probably earn 13 pound, 51 pence a month and then a week and then an hour, but it's just scaling up and it's, you know, all right, let's stop doing what isn't working. Let's figure out some stuff that is working. Let's try different things, see what works. Ah, that works. Right. We'll do some more of that. So it changed very, very rapidly from there. So the April, I earned 13 pound, 51 pence. By the September, I was able to go part time with the civil service. I went down to three days a week. Right. So I think I had, what days did I have off? I used to work Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. So I had Mondays and Thursdays off. Thursday was newsletter day. I'd, I'd send an email out promoting our latest offers and I'd earn a load of money on the Thursday. Monday was admin day. I would do keep on top of the emails, everything like that. But you see how rapidly I went from like, basically earning bugger all in the April mm. to by the August thinking, okay, I'm pulling in maybe, I don't know, say three or 400 quid a month at this point. It's like, okay, this, this could last. Yeah. Let's see what happens if I go part time. And again, very difficult conversation to have with the family. Mm. You know, that safe, secure job that I took. Yeah. I'm going part time on it. <laughs> and it, it, it would, you know, from my point of view, that was the, that was the safest, most secure thing I could do because I can always go back to them cap in hand and say, yeah, the business hasn't worked out. Can I go full time again? And they would have probably said, yeah, absolutely fine. I wasn't burning any bridges there. 
until I started being able to devote entire days to my business rather than, you know, what I'd done before, which was I'd work 40 hours a week in the day job, come home. Um, I normally get home about half past nine at night. So I used to work the evening shift yes. and I'd work on, on the business then from 10 PM until I don't know, three in the morning, four in the morning. I'd, I'd dive into chat rooms um, with other people who were also learning. And it, there was a real camaraderie at the time between a load of us who honestly didn't know what we were doing. Mm. Um, and the growth that a lot of them had over that time was phenomenal. You know, there was, um, there was a truck driver who became a millionaire. There was a guy who worked in, uh, worked in a factory in Sunderland. He, he, he now lives in LA, um, working for Warner music. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was a guy who ran a wedding stationery thing. He was on the Sunday times rich list two years later. Um, this was the growth that people were having then. I wasn't having anything on that scale, but still to go from 13 pound, 51 pence to 300 quid a month, giving up the day job or giving up part time. So we're going part time. Unfortunately, what happened then was I started earning more money mm. from the business mm. because I could see actually, if I can spend the whole day on a Thursday, sending out emails, promoting offers, actually marketing the business i earn a lot more money than i do sat in the day job and then i'd be back in there on on the wednesday going because wednesday was post day in the civil service i hated post day <laughs> the post day is the day when all the people who are really 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 angry write to you and tell you all of their problems and they've got really complex problems yeah and they want it solved now I used to hate post day <laughs> and I'd be sat there going, right. Okay. I'm earning say 30 quid to be here today. How much is that per hour? How much is that per minute? Yeah. <laughs> I've been sat there with my calculator again going, right. Okay. Oh, if I go for a cigarette now, I can earn 49 pence whilst I'm having a cigarette. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also sat there going, okay, I'm earning 30 quid today. If I was sat at home working on my business, I could probably earn a hundred quid today. Yeah. And that was that realization that, do you know what? It's costing me money to come to work. And so I went part time on, on like the first of September and by November I'd handed my notice in. Wow. <laughs> so like, I'm quitting. And again, that was a interesting conversation with the family. Um, I think by this time they'd, they'd understood a little bit more about, I, I did know what I was doing. They they did not understand the business at all. No, of course not. Let's face it, I didn't understand it six months earlier. No, and I mean, I'm just going to give you a pause there for you to, mm -hmm. to, to catch your breath and, and thought and thoughts and have a drink. I, I'm just going to grab a lesson out of what you've done there because, and I, I did not do this and I made a mistake when I first started to set up my own business. I literally went, left one day and then tried to set my business up from there, which financially was a real struggle for me. Yeah. But what you did there, and I think this is something that for our listeners who want to get out of their dead end job that they're hating and have very little money and job satisfaction and happiness to, to show for it is if you can reduce your hours with your existing employer and they're happy to do that because you want to do other things in your life, then you have that security whilst you're continuing to set up your business, feeling and testing the water and see how things are going. It means you have continuity of income. It means you have continuity of, you know, having relationships with your existing em employer. And I mean, lots of employees these days welcome that, you know, they welcome the honesty to say, look, you know, I want to continue working for you, but I want to reduce my hours because this is what's happening in my life. Yeah. And it's, it's a nicer way to then find out if your business idea is going to have legs or not, because you're practicing, you're learning, you're growing, you're testing the market out and see if there is going to be, you know, a need for your product or service. So, and I think that's a much 
gentler way. You still have to be brave. Don't get me wrong. You still have to be like, okay, I'm going to reduce my hours. What if it doesn't work? Yeah. But you have something to fall back on there. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I remember um, so it was in November. My, my sister died and I had some, um, some leave from the, from the day job. And literally one of the last conversations I had with her was about, look, I'm going to be quitting. And she said to me, well, do, do you know what you're doing? Um, and I said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm confident, you know, I'm, I'm happy that if this doesn't work out, I can get back to where I was mm. within six months. You know, I've got some money in the bank now whereby, okay, if the internet thing goes completely tits up and self implodes, then I've got four months to find myself another job. I can very easily, I've got contacts within the civil service, I've got contacts within the job center. I can always find another job. And it's that, that realization. I ha I've actually had this conversation now with um, one of our mentoring clients. Actually, I'm thinking of in particular, and I had this conversation with him about, I think about two or three years ago now. Uh, he was, he'd been made redundant um, from his job and said, look, I've been offered another job or I've been offered the chance to start my own business. Yeah. And obviously you know, I'm very passionate about small businesses. Yeah. And I said to him, what do you really want to do? And he, I said, you know, talk, talk me through the options. And he talked me through these two options. And I said, okay. I said, uh, I've not listened to a word you've said. He went, oh, I said, no, what I've been doing is I've been watching your face. <laughs> well, she's been talking about these two options. I said, and there was only one of those two options that your face was lit up, that it was animated. That's what you need to do. He said, which one was that? I said, you know which one that was? He said, yeah. He said, I, I want to, I want to run my own business. Um, and we had this little conversation because again, he's come from uh, a corporate background where he's worked in this industry for, since leaving school, you know, 20 years. Nice, safe, secure job, job for life until it's not, until your employer says, actually, no, off you go. And I said to him, okay, let's say you do the business, you start it up and it all goes tits up. How quickly can you get back where you are now? How quickly can you find another job? He said, well, he said, if, I, if it fails within six months, he said, I've got 12 months worth of um, earnings. Yeah. He said, I'll know within six months whether it's working or not. And as long as I'm not away from the industry too long, I can just go and take that job or that job, or I can ring up somebody here and get a job in this. So there was actually very little risk. Yes. And he's actually now going through a similar process whereby he's got another opportunity now to kind of level up and take a different business in a different direction. Yeah. I met up with him last weekend and we had this exact same conversation. Um, I said, look, he said, I want to do this. But I've got the security of what I'm doing now versus the, the risk, but the potential reward of what I want to do. And again, I asked that same question. How quickly could you get back where you are now? Oh, well, really quickly. Easy. No worries. I, I could do that simply. Okay. There's no risk then, is there? No. No, of course ah. not. <laughs> and it's just that, that realization that if this doesn't work out, it's a setback. It's a bump in the road. You yeah. can get back where you are now, given a few months, or you might lose a few grand. But you're not going to be destitute. You're not going to be on the streets. You're not going to be sleeping in your car. You, well, I don't know. It depends how, how all in you're going on your business, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Um, but for most people, they the you know, if you take the risks and you take calculated risks and you just look at actually where I am now. Is in it? Yes, it's a nice, safe, secure place. I can get back here again. Mm. And it's it is that just reducal reducal? That's a nice word, isn't it? <laughs> Reduction of the risk. Yes. Um, and it's or the realization of what the risk actually is. It's not oh, if this doesn't work, what the hell am I going to do? It's well, if this doesn't work, I'll go back to doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. Maybe for someone else. Maybe I've got to eat some humble pie. Maybe I've got to, um, you know 
go crawling on my knees to someone who I don't particularly like. Maybe I'm going to lose a few quid. Maybe I've got to, you know, um, live on the overdraft for a few months. But I can get back where I was. That's it. Yeah, it's having it's having, you know, a plan basically mm. that says if it doesn't work, that's my full that's plan B. You know, yeah. plan A. This is what I want to do. I'm going to go for it. Plan B is if it doesn't work out, I've got so I've got another plan. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I might have some pain, but you know, we all have to take calculated risk in that way and say it's either going to work or it isn't. But I'm going to have a go because I've I have a faith in myself, and you know, and the trouble sometimes is whether it's a teacher, family, you love them, and yeah. sometimes they are not the best judges because they don't know what you've gone through to get the knowledge and the experience of and having the confidence to start something on your own. And they, they don't want you to get hurt. So they go, yeah, oh, they, you know. They don't want you to be in danger, do they? That's and right. All they, you know, we, we, as business owners, we evaluate. I think I, I you talked about this in the last podcast, didn't I? Risk versus reward. Mm, that's right. And some people only see the risk. And that particularly with those who care and love you will see the risks and they'll say, Oh my God. Yeah. But if you do this and it fails, what you're giving up the safety and security you've got now, you're giving up your reputation. Oh my God. What if this goes wrong? Yeah. But what if it goes right? This is it. <laughs> this is totally it. And that, that lesson can be implied, applied in business and how people recruit uh, how they evaluate people in business, you know, employees, uh, or if, how, how they invest in training. You know, when they say, oh, well, if I invest training these people, what if they leave? Yeah, yeah. well, what if they stay? <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, what if you don't and they stay? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, duh. <laughs> so, yeah, l I love it. So, okay, what happened next? Can't wait. So, after... Yeah, so I quit the day job. Um, I actually, I'm looking at my desk right now, and I've got a calendar on my desk. It consists of some cubes, and it's got days of the week, months, and it's got numbers on it, and it's set permanently. This uh, this little calendar to Monday, December the thirty first. Right. And it's st still sat on my desk. I so say I'm looking at it right now, and that's symbolic because Monday, December the thirty first. 2001 is the last day that I worked for the civil service. It's the last day that I worked for anybody other than myself. And it's there as a reminder that this is my life. This is my job now. This is what I do. I work for me. I, I am fully unemployable now. Correct. Um, but it's just that realization that, okay, you want to do this. You, you know, why I left was to be my own boss primarily. Yes. Over the years, we've gone in several different directions and we've often chased big money. Mm. It's good. I've earned great money. Don't get me wrong. But that's not my motivator. My motivator is to be my own boss. Um, in, the, in the book, I wrote my ideal job description, which was to do what I want, where I want, when I want, how I want, <laughs> if I want. <laughs> And, and that's it. That's all I want to do. Yeah. I want to do things my way yes. if I can be bothered doing them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very simple job description, isn't it, John? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, that's what's worked for me. And that's almost the polar opposite of the civil service, which is you do it the civil service way. Why? Well, because we do. That's why we've done it for 25 years. But that doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear that it doesn't make sense. Just do it. Oh, okay. By the way, he has 17 forms to fill in. And the thing is, there are, you know, organizations like that have to exist, I guess, because they have to run the country. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and there are people who are quite, I'm putting quotes in this word now, are quite happy to be working there and doing that job. Yeah. Because they have a self-belief of themselves that that's all they are good for <laughs> or that's all they want to achieve in life, you know, and, 
And actually, they may get enough money from her to have their, you know, two holidays a year, yeah. uh, buy the presents for Christmas. And, you know, they're quite happy in doing that. But there are other people like you and me who have worked for companies and I've probably worked in companies longer than you. But at some stage, you kind of go, actually, I don't respect you anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I actually respect my own thoughts and ideas more so than yours. Therefore, yeah. I can't keep saying yes to everything that I'm told that you've got to do. Yeah. Because I've got my own ideas and I'm going to go out there and try them out. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what you've done. And that's what, you know, lots of people can do if, if they take some action in their lives. So, yeah, fabulous. Exactly. Is that taking action? I think that's, that's the key element. Um, Again, I've got um, sort of uh, what I call my magic ingredients for success printed on my wall. Um, just run through them at the moment. So we've got goals, desire, knowledge, environment. And the last one, which I've got in red print, it's kind of two foot high letters on my wall, is action. Yes. Because unless you take action, nothing changes. You know, you can plan strategy all you like, but act yeah. you've actually got to do something. And sooner or later you've actually got to pick up the phone and speak to a customer. You've actually got to send an email out. You've actually got to put that website live. Yeah. Um, you know, I was chatting to one of our mentoring clients this morning and he's, he's talking about um, pitching to a, um, a shop that he's trying to get some furniture into. Mm. And he said, well, I might just um, polish up the website first. I need to get that looking right. I said, no, pick up the phone now. Book <laughs> the meeting. Get the website sorted later. Let's mm. book the meeting now. Mm. Take action. Because otherwise you, you just potter around and too many people are pottering around in their businesses mm. moving bits of paper around and being very busy but not really achieving anything and that's because they're not taking the right action absolutely and and it's also you know so why people aren't taking the right action there's one word that exists in every person's life, whether it's your personal or business life, and that is fear. Mm. And, you know, most people, I'll repeat it, but most people know the what fear stands for, for and that is false expectations appearing real. Yeah. But people, fear stops people from moving forward. And actually, what is the worst that can happen? You know, the worst, if you keep asking that question, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? Eventually, it's I'm rough sleeping somewhere, you know? Yeah. I, uh, that's the worst that can happen. Ultimately, that's where, and I haven't got any food, you know? But even if you continue with that, well, the worst that can happen is you're going to die, right? Yeah. If you take it to its ultimate conclusion, well, if you're dead, you've got no worries anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's still not the worst that can happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and fear stops people from taking action. It stops them from moving forward. It stops yeah. them from having the conversation, from asking the question. Well, again, it's an interesting comment there because people do tend to ask themselves, what's the worst that can happen? Mm. But they don't tend to ask themselves, what's the best that could happen? Correct. And, you know, let's, I, I've done that when I've got several decisions to make. I think, actually, okay. Let's make the pros and cons list mm. and let's let's evaluate. Okay, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, what are the signs that that is happening? Because the worst that can happen is when it reaches its end conclusion. Yes. If I let things happen to that extent, you know, you said about being homeless and on the streets, that's if I allow things to get to that point. At what point, you know, do I reach before that where I spot, oh, hang on, this is the path I'm heading down. Mm. Where do we cut the losses? Mm. You know, we, we just set out what the roadmap looks like. The roadmap to success looks like this. The roadmap to failure looks like this. All of a sudden, three months from now, six months from now, you know what path you're on. And you know either I'm on the road to failure and I need to change things or I'm on the road to success and I need to carry on doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but people just think, you know, um, if I'm on the road to failure – that's it. Now, for some reason, there's a brick under my accelerator and it's just powering me at 100 miles an hour in this direction. Yeah. No, you can lift your foot off the gas and turn the bloody wheel. Yeah, do something about <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. 
the power is in in our hands at the end of the day. It is absolutely, yeah. So, okay. So where where have we got to and and because you've you've run a number of different businesses and, I have yes. And and I mean it says 60 on your profile. Are we yeah, having, absolutely. We might not have time to go through all 60. <laughs> What I'm, what I'm interested, and I want to make sure we get across to people, is what are you doing today? So having gone through the journey of learning about all of these businesses that you've run, yeah. what, where has that led you to? And are you still running some of them? Or what, what is the, well, what's the, what's the big idea, John? <laughs> Absolutely. So at the moment, I would say I'm running three or four different companies at right. the moment. Um, we've got some other joint venture stuff that's going on, but I don't tend to get involved with the day-to-day of that. I'm more of an advisor role. Mm -hmm. Um, the 50 to 60 businesses. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think if you were to go back in time, let's say about 12 years, I was probably running 20 at the same time. Um, which is very difficult trying to, uh, sell office space whilst also renting out servers and working with florists and running a student website and selling mobile phone insurance um, and live streaming football results and selling villa holidays abroad and creating um, a guide to the Algarve. <laughs> Very difficult to do all of those things at the same time. Totally. Uh, we tried it. It didn't work very well. So... Um, one of my key things was focusing mm. on let's, you know, let's look at the, the 80, 20 analysis. What's bringing in 80% of the money that takes 20% of the time. And that was for us was our sports betting business. Right. Um, so ever since 2012, we've focused almost exclusively on that business. Yes. Um, and we've grown that business massively now. I think in 2012, it was doing about 75,000 a year. Um, it's now up to three quarters of a million a year. Um, six full-time members of staff, um, great little business. Absolutely love that business. Um, but it got to the point and it fully designed about two years ago, whereby that business was running itself and myself and my business partner, Jason, we deliberately set this business up so that we were not needed for the day to day running of that business. Mm. And so it would have been the summer holidays two years ago, 2016, I was in, I think it was in Lanzarote for a fortnight with the family. And as I got into the custom now, the laptop stayed at home. Um, I had the phone with me. I filtered some emails, but I didn't really work for two weeks solid. I then came back to the UK and I had one day whereby both myself and Jason were in the same country because I was, I was away for two weeks and then Jason was away for the following two weeks. So we had this one day that we were both in the country and we had this little handover meeting as we always did. And I, I, I almost used to dread this because I've had two weeks of rest and relaxation, just sitting by a pool, reading Kindle books and eating ice cream. Yes. And now I'm sat down with Jason going, okay, what fires do I need to put out? What's happened? What's, what's hit the fan? And he went, um, hmm. Yeah, nothing really. <laughs> um, yeah, everything's been okay. Oh, all right. Oh, oh that's brilliant. Um, okay, what do you need me to look at whilst you're away in the next two weeks then? Um, not a lot, really. <laughs> you know, I've set everything up. All the systems and processes are working as they should be. Um, oh, you can have a chat with Stu if you like. He's working on this project at the moment. Just check he's happy. Okay, brilliant. Chase, do you know do you know what just happened? What? We've just we've we've done it. We've created this business that works without us. Brilliant. My God, yes, we have. And we had this this moment of euphoria whereby we realized that yeah, we'd achieved the goal that we set out kind of two or three years earlier. Mm. And that then didn't last very long because then Jason went away. So I didn't have him to speak to for the next two weeks. And I had, I'm sat there with my own thoughts thinking I've done it. I've achieved my goal. Brilliant. Well done me. Pat myself on the back. Of course. What the hell do I do now? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like, it's like my child has grown up and gone away to university and moved away and doesn't need me anymore. <laughs> oh, what, what purpose do I have now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so Jason got back and I said, right, that, that's great that we've got this business that runs itself. But I'm, what was I telling you? I'm, so I'm 37 years old. I cannot be retiring at age 37. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, my golf game is not that good. No. So I said, look, we need to do something else. Um, and a, for about the previous two years, we've been involved with a local um, sort of entrepreneurial networking group here in Plymouth. Yes. Um, and that had actually shut down about six months earlier. So there was nothing for us. So we really, really enjoyed just sitting around a table with other small business owners. And I said, you know what? I really loved doing that. Do you reckon we could do that ourselves? We've got time on our hands now. We've got experience. At the time we had, was it 16 years experience of running businesses? So I said, let's do it. Let's, let's just set up with some people who are new to business. So they've been in business maybe six months or 12 months. Um, around my kitchen table, let's not charge them anything. Let's just say, look, turn up once a month to my kitchen table and we'll just, we'll help you. We'll mentor you for free with your business. And we did that for a year. Wow. And Oh my God, the results we saw from those mentees were just unbelievable. Mm. The growth that they had and the mistakes that they didn't make because they were at the same journey. I was back in 2000 or 2001. Yes. But they were, they were about to make the same mistakes that I made. I was like, no, stop. Don't, no, don't <laughs> go off down that road. That's wrong. That's wrong. This is what you need to do. And it was like, I got to be Clark. You remember Clark who helped me out yes. way back in 2000? Yeah, you were giving back. I got back. to be Clark. You were giving back. Exactly. <laughs> and it was, I suddenly realized why Clark did it. Because all of a sudden I had that warm, fuzzy feeling inside that these people I'm giving help and advice to are succeeding. And it's because of the help I'm giving them. Yes. So we did that, I say, free for a year. And I said to Jason, right, let's make this a real thing. So this would have been uh, the December, probably December 2016. And I said to him, do you fancy doing a podcast? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, yeah, why not? Let's, let's do it. So I said, you know, we've helped around this table eight business owners massively grow their business. So I really, really enjoyed that. But that's eight people. I want to help more people. I want to, I want to scale up and help more people. So I said to him, right, let's launch the podcast. I said, you know what? I, I was chatting to one of my mentors and I said to him, yeah, told him all the stories about the roller coaster ride that we've had and the, the journey we've been on. He said, you know what? You've got a book in you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, they say everyone's got a book in them. I said, I'm not sure I want to write a book. And he said, no, no. He said, you've got to get this book out there. So I said to Jace, okay, let's do the podcast. Let's do a different topic every week. Uh, we started off weekly. We ended up monthly in the end because I don't know if you noticed, Michael, but recording a podcast is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just turning a microphone on and boom, you've got an episode in the bag, is it? No, nope, no, nope, <laughs> definitely not. So I said, we'll do that. We'll get the episodes transcribed. And then I will turn that transcription into a chapter for the book. And within three months, I've got my book written. That was the plan. Yes. By the time I sat down with my first um, transcription notes from a podcast and it was just unusable. <laughs> oh, wow. But I'd then committed publicly that I was going to write this book. Yes. And I said, okay, it's coming out. It's coming out on the 21st of June, longest day of the year. Uh, we are launching Big Ideas for Small Businesses. Um, my book is, is coming out. You can buy it then. We created a Facebook group around that. We then launched the, uh, the book. So it actually launched in July because... I naively thought once you finished writing the book, as yeah. in it's done as a word document. Yes. Wow, that that's that's the hard work done, isn't it? That's <laughs> yeah. All you've got to do then is design the cover, get it printed up and published and proofread and edited and formatted and marketed and, and then it just becomes a book. That's right. Easy. Unfortunately, that last bit of the editing, the proofreading, the formatting, the marketing, that apparently takes about three or four months. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't expect I, that <laughs> no i'm literally i went to um i went to a book coach and i said to this lady she was recommended to me and lots of people said oh you need to speak to this lady she's brilliant so i said yeah we'll have a chat i said here, here you go here's my manuscript it's it's all ready to go just needs proofreading and editing and then i'm i'm good to launch that's you know? it and she's like yeah that's cool i can do that um 
you know, my normal process is that I, I take your manuscript and I turn it into a completed book uh, within 12 weeks. Oh, my God. Oh, 12 weeks. That's that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I launch my launch day when I've got an event booked and I've got people coming. That's in six weeks. Oh, 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 right. Hmm. OK, it's possible (laughs) (laughs) and i nearly broke this poor lady over the following six weeks oh god (laughs) we eventually got to the stage whereby she would not let me rush out she was god bless her she was absolutely right she was like no john you are not cutting any corners on this book um how many books are you planning on writing i said well just the one said right let's make this one bloody right then shall we yes yes (laughs) ma'am Um, but she's absolutely right because I would have been happy to say do you know what it's good enough let's get it out there but Mm. she was like no let's get it right let's get it perfect yeah Um, so we got a good enough version ready for the launch so everybody that was at the launch got a copy of the book it wasn't the full one it was full yeah I think I called it uh, the director's cut the original full of all the original typos as intended by the author yes (laughs) So everyone got a copy of that. It was um, then we had a further three weeks to build up the proper launch when we actually got it into Amazon mm. and we said, look, everyone who basically it, it actually worked in our favor because everyone who had a free copy and we'd given them some free beer and we'd fed them pasties and burgers and everything like that. We then said to them, OK, you've had all these freebies off us. Now go and buy the book. It's 99p on Kindle or it's like I think five quid on paperback and it went straight to the bestseller on the small business section Brilliant. like within half a day of launching and it was just such an amazing feeling um it's ironically stayed there ever since not number one but it's in the top 10 on the small business section ever since and it's just it's really taken off it's if anyone out there is thinking about writing a book mm. honestly you need to get it out there um I've spoken to people before who've written books and they always said the same thing to me. They said to me, you've got to get this book out there. And I'm now here saying the same thing to everyone else. It is the best business card you will ever have. Because if I want people to work with me, you know, we, we've got a, so we've expanded the mentoring now. So we've got a paid group mentoring service called the 1% club. Yeah. And the best tool we've used, we've got for recruiting people into that is the book because these people have invested 12 quid in the paperback. They've invested five hours of their time reading it. Yeah. By now they know what I'm about. They know my story. They know if we relate to each other or not. If we don't, they self exclude themselves and I don't ever see them. Sure. If they actually really relate to what I'm talking about, then they approach me and have it. We have a conversation. Yeah. Um, and it, it honestly is the best business card you'll ever have you're not going to make any money out of actually selling the book so if you're thinking right, i'm going to put a book out there and it's going to have me 100 grand a year forget it unless you're jk rowling and you're very very lucky you're not going to make money by selling your book yeah i but if I you've agree got a story that. to tell yeah and you can tell that story and get people to resonate and explain what you do then you will get you will get business referring itself to you mm. um already pre-qualified um one of one of my um friends and colleagues put out a book last year on public relations and she's been a pr expert for several years yes but she's had to go out and get business she's had to pitch for business she released her book last year went to number one bestseller in the pr section on amazon Mm. what do you know she now gets people approaching her oh you're the lady that wrote the book on pr and that's that's the correlation. She is now the lady who wrote the book on PR. Yeah. She's now a celebrity. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, honestly, if, if anyone out there is thinking about writing a book, at least get your manuscript out there. Get it on paper. Start writing it. Um, because, yeah, as soon as I started writing it, I was determined I was going to finish it. And once I saw it taking shape, I realized that, yes, I did actually have a book in me. You know, there there are actually stories in there that are of interest. There are lots of lessons to be taken from it. And the thing is that, that, I mean, one of the reasons I started this podcast is to hear people's stories. I mean, Mm. everybody's story is unique. 
And actually, lots of people believe that their story isn't unique. Yeah. But of course it is. You know, fair enough, somebody might have gone a similar journey, but it's still unique, you know, to that individual. Yeah. And it's also how people relate to you. As you said, they either buy you or they don't by hearing or reading your story. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And that's when people resonate with an individual and go, actually, I like her, him, and not because of what they do, but because of who they are and their story. Because that's what people buy at the end of the day. They don't buy, they're not, you know, they're not buying the book, they're buying the story. And that's, yeah, absolutely. that's what they connect with. And you're absolutely right. People aren't going to be billionaires through their book, but it's, it's, and I haven't got a book. And yeah, maybe there is a book in me somewhere. But I think the important thing is that people do kind of go, oh, you've got a book. You know, it's that like, oh, okay, this person must be important. <laughs> They've yeah, got a it's book. It's the ultimate <laughs> positioning tool. It's, it's a credibility yeah, builder, isn't it? It helps. Definitely helps. Okay. <laughs> so, so you've got the book. Uh, you started the podcast, and we, we briefly touched on that right at the beginning. So you've now you're effectively doing mentoring for free on the podcast. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do it as you know. Obviously, we do it because we love it. Yeah. Um, and many, you know, lots of people question. You know, how do you come up with you know the the topics, and how do you you know actually film it? I said it's very simple, really. Jason and I have always had these Monday morning meetings. And what we do now is we just have a rough topic of what we're going to talk about and we turn the mics on. Mm. You know, it's literally, we'd be talking about this stuff anyway. Yeah. You know, these are the, these are the topics that we, these are the discussions we're always having. Yeah. Um, people say, oh, you've got really good banter between you. It's like, that's, that's us normally. <laughs> Correct. And obviously anyone who's been part of our mentoring group who's seen us at work knows that, yeah, that's, that's us. That's the way we are with each other. Mm. Um, I was talking yesterday, actually, it's uh, 15 years this year that Jason first came to work for me. Um, and it's just amazing to see that journey that he's been on. Um, but that, that relationship that we've got now, we do bounce off each other so well. Um, but I think the podcast comes very naturally to us um, because it is the two of us, because we're very good friends and we're very passionate about small businesses and about helping them grow and helping them avoid the mistakes that we've made. Again, we, yeah, we're very candid about saying, do you remember when we messed up here? Oh my God, what an amazing mess up that was that we did. Yeah. What the hell were we thinking? Yeah. <laughs> and it, look, it's the only way you're going to learn through making mistakes. And it's not suggesting to people that you'll never make any mistakes because you are going to make mistakes. Exactly. It's exactly. human nature, but it's, yeah, learning from them and taking the lesson and avoiding it next time. That's Absolutely. the best thing to do. Yeah. So I think it's brilliant the work you guys are doing with that and obviously the book and the mentoring and everything else. So, I, I mean, we could literally talk <laughs> for a few hours um, <laughs> about this topic because I, I will let you have the last say, but in terms of, You've shared lots of highlights and challenges and, and everything else that's been going through your business. So I'm going to ask you a question about that. But I think small businesses are, as everybody always tells us, the backbone of this country. Without, without small businesses, there, we don't have a country effectively. Yeah. So, so what for you, I mean, you've shared some of them as the journey, but if you were to pick one thing out and say, what, what have been some of the challenges or challenge, what was be the biggest challenge for running your own business? And equally, you have kind of shared it already, but is there one, and you may repeat what you've already said, doesn't matter, but what's been one of the major highlights for you? So I think, yeah, the biggest challenge I had I mean, we've had some big challenges. You know, we've had Google have wiped out all of our traffic overnight, gone from, you know, a million visitors a year down to kind of 300 mm. a month. Um, had a period where I very nearly lost the business. It nearly went under in kind of 2006. And I was having health issues, almost like a nervous breakdown. Mm. Um, 
But for me, the biggest challenge I had was right at the beginning where I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing in terms of the biggest hurdle that I needed to overcome with, yeah, if I did not overcome that hurdle, literally I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. I would be sat in a civil service office somewhere. Um, I needed to overcome that lack of knowledge. Um, again, I say it's one of, one of those magic five ingredients is knowledge. Yeah. Um, and knowing that I knew nothing and then seeking out that mentor, that someone that, who's got the blueprint, who's ahead of me, um, you know, without overcoming that challenge, nothing else would have happened. So yeah, all the, all the bad stuff that's happened is just coming down from a high. Yes. Um, whereas getting over that initial, my God, I know nothing. Mm. That, that was the toughest challenge I had to overcome. Um, in terms of highlights, Again, there's, there's been lots of highs. Um, book launch is probably one of them. Yes. The business running itself is another. You know, we've, mm. um, you know, we, we sold one of our main businesses. Christ, what was that? Eleven years ago now, for a decent chunk of change. It's like okay, we've made a lot of money. We've made, we've had a lot of success. But yeah, I, I, that high, the main highlight remains for me that thirteen pound fifty one, <laughs> because that was honestly that was the pivotal moment that I knew. This works. Mm. My God, I can do this. Yeah. So, yeah, in terms of highlights, by far, though it's in monetary terms, it's absolutely bugger all. Mm. It was the highlight that I knew, Jesus, I'm onto something here. Yeah. It was, you might, you know, scientists say that, um, you know, the, the world's greatest discoveries start with the words, hmm, that's, that's interesting. That, you know, that's the moment they remember is that eureka moment, isn't yeah. it? The, you know, um, Newton sat under the tree and, oh, the Apple phone said, oh, ah, ah. £13.51. Yeah. That was my, aha. <laughs> Brilliant. <moment. laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay, so thank you, John. This has been a wonderful discussion and um, I, you're going to have to come back for probably a second podcast to hear more. <laughs> but let, let people kind of get hold of you. And so why don't you share with us where, where they can find you? And I will include the links in the show notes, but um, where, where can they get hold of you or find out what you're doing specifically? Yeah, perfect. So uh, we've got the Big Idea podcast, which obviously is available on iTunes, Stitcher, all the usual platforms. Uh, we've got Big Ideas for Small Businesses. That is the book I previously mentioned. Obviously, it's available on Amazon. Over 85 five-star reviews as of literally 10 o'clock when I last checked it because I do check it every hour. Excellent. <laughs> um, and so you we've should. Also got, uh, we've also got the free mentoring group um, that we do on Facebook that is called Ambitious Lifestyle Business, which if you've read the book, you know that's that's a term I talk about um, quite a lot. Uh, one of the things I thought we'd um, we do for um, your listeners, Michael, is to give them a, a free sample chapter of the book, actually, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if they want to head along to bigidea.co.uk forward slash John, yeah, that's with a H J or H N. Um, we can give them a free sample chapter from Big Ideas for Small Businesses. Um, and yeah, see what they think of it. See how they resonate with the story. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I I I I love the topic. Um, I think what you've done is amazing. So congratulations to your journey. I know it hasn't finished by a long term because you're still really really young. And um, but I look forward to to following your journey. I I really do hope we meet up. You're way down south. I'm in the Midlands, but hopefully we can meet in the middle somewhere one day. And, oh, absolutely, and, definitely, and grab a coffee. So, John, take care, and hope to see you soon. No, thank you for having me, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure. Bye for now. Thanks, Ed. Bye bye. Staying alive, UK. Share your story. 